Slacky's note. I said Juliana Lima about a hundred times during this episode. I meant Juliana Pena. Switch that out in your head. Oi oi, it's your boy Jack Slack broadcasting live from the funeral of women's MMA. <laughs> or at least women's MMA above 115 pounds. Uh, went, went to the funeral of my biggest hater just to make sure he did. Um, <laughs> what a ridiculous card. Uh, some of it good, some of it... Well, I don't know. I think all ridiculous is good, even ridiculous bad. I only have time to enjoy what is uh, truly good or frankly bad. And a lot of this card was either of those things. Main event was absolutely banging. Everything you hoped for. I said this might be the best fight going. And uh, yeah, it, it sort of lived up to that. Um, Co-main was supposed to be another cakewalk. And it wasn't. And should we start with that? I feel like a lot of people are going to come in and be like, I need to hear jack shit on women's MMA above 115 pounds. <laughs> Some truly amazing takes out there now. Like, well, this clearly means that Shevchenko is the women's goat. And you're like, well, no, because Shevchenko was terrified of trading punches with Bernard Nunes. And it turns out all you had to do was do that. Um, Juliana Pena comes out with her wine mum boxing. Like she's getting into a fight because someone spiked the punch at the parent-teacher meeting. And that was enough. That's all she had to do. All she had to do was what Ronda Rousey did, but not get blown away in the opening seconds. Spam one twos, mate. It's too powerful. Um, but realistically, let's have a talk about that fight. Firstly, Juliana Lima, we had, we had a great laugh last week because on the boycast I was saying, this is the girl that they keep being like on commentary. I mean, it came out this week that DC doesn't actually watch fights, even the ones he's commentating. He has someone else do it for him and do the research. But every time that I've watched the Juliana Lima fight in preparation for this, DC's gone like, well, she's a phenomenal grappler and takedown artist, and then she's done nothing to back that up. Um, it, including in the fight with Jermaine Durandamy, almost, well, she she got on top and she tried to guillotine choke Jermaine Durandamy from half guard, but didn't have the underhook and fell off into bottom position. And then Jermaine Durandamy almost Von Flu choked her. Jermaine Durandamy almost Von Flu choked her. Take that in for a second. And then later in the fight, Jermaine Durandamy actually did one-armed guillotine her for the only submission win of Jermaine Durandamy's career. And then he watched her against Sarah McCann, uh, sorry, McMahon, rather, and uh, just, yes, yes, ragdolled. But that's expected because Sarah McMahon is... Uh, world-class wrestler or was a world-class wrestler. But yeah, it was just like a case of sort of outlasting her. Um, but yeah, like consistently, Juliana Pena's career has been underwhelming. Or unimpressive, is what I'd say. She came into this one, she comes out, gets in her stance, and she shoulder fakes like a level change about 18 times, standing on the spot, uh, and then gets dropped by the first calf kick, and then dropped by the first good punch. Um, and then Nunes goes into top half-guard position, and I will say this, count the number of strikes that Nunes landed from top position. And it wasn't because she wasn't trying. Every time she got into top half guard, uh, Lima grabbed some underbutt and started coming up on the single leg. And then Amanda Nunes would wrap the head to try for a guillotine choke and um, Lima would put her back to the floor and start working on the Kimura. And she went back to her corner and uh, they said, why are you not coming up on singles? And she said, because when I do, she goes for the choke. And they said, okay. And that was it. Like that was your explanation for that. But um, she ended up with the Kimura grip from half guard. Amanda, she she sort of like you, you know how we talk about like Matt Linden did it once. Um, in case of Minna, people like that. If you get the Kimura grip from half guard and you use your knee, you can push them with your knee, free your bottom leg, and go into the turtle with the Kimura and start standing up. Obviously, which is the the ideal goal in MMA. But um, in the course of trying to do that, she basically gave up her back, and uh, Nunes sort of jumped on it. But if you go back and watch it. The commentators were screaming over the top of it, but um, Nunes had one hook in and her other arm was being like stretched out. Like not, she wasn't going to get straight arm locked from the back. Like big judo dudes who are very lazy will try that to you in rolling from time to time. But it's very hard to straight arm lock someone with a Kimura grip when they're on your back. But it meant that she couldn't use both hands and um, she didn't have one of her hooks in. So she really had the top hook in. Uh, so so Lima was almost, she wasn't in. I was going to say she was almost out, but she wasn't in. Um, Amanda basically wrapped her chin and couldn't do anything with it. But then Amanda Nunes tried to use her foot to free her arm that was in the Kimura slash straight arm lock. 
and she added pressure to it. She like straightened her own arm out by accident, which was funny. Um, but then, so basically, she uh, tried to come up on top of Lima instead of trying to get to her back. Lima turned into her back into the half guard. Kimura on the other side, on the other arm. Puts in the butterfly hook, starts sweeping her. Very impressive stuff. I thought the, the bottom game from uh, Juliana Lima, really quite slick. And simple, too. Like, you know, it's, it's very easy to say simple, and then people think you mean, like, an idiot could do it. I mean, an idiot might be aware of those techniques, but, you know, they weren't... She wasn't having to invert or do anything, cl- like, tricky. She was just using basics in a good sequence. Then she comes out for the second round, bang in. <laughs> Just like one, twos. And I said wine mum boxing because her right arm, elbow is out like she's trying to like move people aside. <laughs> she's got her elbow out at like uh, parallel to the floor, throwing her right straight. And um, she's still landing. It's so funny because basically Amanda Nunes goes jab, right hand. And if you throw a jab and right hand at the same time, you will eat the right hand probably. But because Nune, uh, Lima was moving her head a little, you know, it was ugly as fuck. But she was moving her head a little, so every time Nunez threw the one-two, she'd eat the one and the two, and uh, Lima would go one side or the other of the of the two. She'd get hit by the jab quite a lot, but she'd end up slipping the, the two quite um, easily. And I think that just shows that Amanda Nunez is used to people standing there with their heads straight up on a on a line. So when Edmonds was shouting head movement while Ronda Rousey, Ronda Rousey was getting knocked out, he was correct. But yeah, she just put it on her, and um, Nunez... Someone said she looked like she was having a great time. She was smiling quite a lot. Um, but, uh, yeah, she just put it on her. And then uh, Nunez, she moved, she hit her with like two or three in a row, moved her to the fence. She was clear, Nunez was clearly puffing. And, and that's not good because it was round two. And then um, Pena did what Charles Oliveira also did in the main event and what Felicia Spencer did against Megan Anderson, which is she got like her uh, underhook and body lock and stuff along the fence. And then she tried to roll underneath in like a half guard sweep, except she managed it. And it was really cool. And then Amanda Nunez turned to Turtle um, with Lima's arms like locked around her head. And it was a no, didn't look like it was under the chin, but it was a no hooks tap out almost immediately. I think Amanda Nunez basically was like, yeah, this isn't going well. And, and um, tapped out. You know, not going to shame her for that, but just um, she didn't put up much of a fight in the wrestling part once it was very clear that you know, they, even if you get caught by surprise and you give up underhooks as she moves into the clinch along the fence, it's then clear that she's grappling. So you should have been ready for a little bit of a fight, but I think she was just absolutely knackered. But then Pena after the fight immediately just got in the post fight interview. She was like, uh, I'm actually the first mum champ in the UFC because I gave birth to a child. And you're like, yes, technically that is actually very impressive to give birth, you know, carry and give birth to a child and then get back to champion status. But read the room. <laughs> just, you're just going to make people angry saying that. You know, because it reads like uh, Amanda Nunez isn't really a mum. And you're just like, no, don't do that, you knob. But anyway, they're going to do an, re- an immediate rematch or they'll do Shevchenko versus Pena 2 at um, Bantamweight. Really, what should happen now is they just cut everything above women's straw weight. But that won't happen, unfortunately. But it does sort of hammer home, like, you know, I think that a lot of people are going to say that uh, Amanda Nunes came in ill-prepared, underestimated her opponent, blah, blah, blah. But we've said for quite a while, like, the thing about Amanda Nunes is the power. She's quite an average fighter in, in most other regards. Um, and, and that is just the game breaker in women's MMA because so, I mean, so much of women's MMA, when you're going like, why is this bad objectively? It's because they can stand in front of each other and disregard each other's punches. And I think that makes it very easy for someone like Amanda Nunes, when no one's avoiding your fucking punches and just standing there and taking them, um, to start blasting people out. You know, it's a good jab, it's a good right hand, it's a good uh, calf kick. And that's about it. With takedowns when you fight Jermaine Durandamy. But stop talking about bad things, Jack. Let's talk about good things. Specifically, the main event. Dustin Poirier versus Charles Oliveira. Did I curse Dustin Poirier by putting up the, uh, or re-uploading the Dustin Poirier Filthy Casuals Guide 2.0? Possibly. Um, but I think a lot of, this is just, the, it's going to be the theme continuously. If, if Charles Oliveira wins his next two fights, if Charles Oliveira fights like Justin Gaethje and Islam Makachev next, or Islam Makachev and then Justin Gaethje, and he beats both, he'll still probably be the underdog in both fights. Because people, I, I said it last week, but it's, it's, burned into your brain you've seen him lose 
you've seen him because he grew up in front of your eyes. You've seen him struggle and lose. He didn't have that nice padding up to 18 and 0 against absolute scrubs. And he had some growing to do. Like, he didn't have his full fledged style from early on. He really did come into his own later in his career. And I say later, I mean, he's still like 30 something. But he's flying the flag for Shootbox, the old Shootbox. I don't think any of the same coaches are there, but he's um, basically the only notable fighter fighting out of there at the moment, which is quite cool. But yes, he, he's been remarkable in his recent run. And I think it was natural for people to underestimate him because Charles Oliveira, sorry, because Dustin Poirier has been so good. He's been about the best you can be without being Habib Nurmagomedov. Everyone thought, like, in another era, this guy would be the guy just defending the title over and over again. But stars make fights, and Charles Oliveira really did make a tough fight for him. One of the things we talked about, you know, which was quite uh, commonly stated um, idea, because it, it seemed quite obvious, a lot of Charles Oliveira, sorry, um, Dustin Poirier's game is built around defending his head, you know, taking blows on the guard and on the top of the head and on the elbows and shoulders so that he can get close enough to counter hit. That's the Philly shell, shoulder roll, whatever you want to call it, Stonewall, in a nutshell. It's a platform for counter offense. It means you can be slightly more comfortable standing in range. And then when you feel the punches, you know that they're close enough to hit back because your arms are going to be about the same length or maybe a little bit shorter than theirs. But um, that's the, the idea of it. The problem is with you, with the way that Dustin does it, especially, and you know, with, with kicks and everything being legal, especially, but especially with the way Dustin does it with his elbow really high up in front of his head. Um, his body is wide open. And this is something that like, this is a choice thing because, um, you know, Dustin Poirier beat Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker could have been hitting the body a lot. Dan Hooker can hit the body very well, but he didn't hit the body very much in that fight at all. He got fixated on the head. Um, and the same is true of a lot of people who fought Dustin Poirier. The body should be a big target, but they just didn't, they either didn't have the tools to do it comfortably or they got carried away headhunting. And and he, you know, by having the fights that he does, he draws people into headhunting and uh, into like life and death brawls. Also, when you're dealing with a very scary counterpunch, you want to make every punch count. And that counterintuitively means like, I'm not going to go for the body because I won't knock him out with a body shot. I want to knock him out in the head, you know. Um, but Charles Oliveira very early got on the front kicks to the body. Lovely digging front kicks with his right leg. Uh, right kicks versus right front kicks versus the southpaw, top notch, uh, and then um, knees, lots of knees to the body. Anytime he came, he pulled him in to the collar tie, he hit him with a knee to the body, or even the standing like underhook clinch along the fence, he hit some knees to the body. Um, the left hook, we talked about it before. I said I don't know how much of a, a deal it's going to be because uh, Poirier does quite a good job of fighting people's lead hands a lot of the time. But every time Dustin Poirier throws his left hand, he does drop his right hand to his chest. And what was happening was that Charles was just catching him with these short left hooks and then pulling him in, just getting the collar tie and trying to hit an elbow or a knee um, and knocking um, Dustin off balance and off rhythm. One of the really interesting things, I think it was round one this happened, but uh, I mean, it was a surprisingly short fight. Well, actually, it wasn't surprisingly short. I mean, both these lads, early finishes. But um, it felt like more happened than there was time for, you know what I mean? When it's so much happens in a fight and then you look back and you go, what, how, how was that only X amount of minutes? But one of the things that happened very early was that Dustin went to throw his left straight and he, he throws his left straight and then he flicks it as a jab again as he steps through and then he throws the overhand right from orthodox. That's the Poirier shift. It's a, a fantastically successful technique. If you've not read Advanced Striking 2.0 Dustin Poirier on the fightprimer.com, go and do that. You, I think you will have to become a boy to read that one, but definitely worth it. Um, but that Dustin Poirier shift, huge part of his game. And it works because so much of MMA striking is like backing up because they, you know, it, whether it's wrestling, kicking, boxing, you, all of those can be mitigated by backing up. Whereas if you sprawl on a, an attempted takedown or what you think was an attempted takedown and he throws an uppercut, you've done the wrong thing. If you try and lean back for a punch and he do drops on your hips instead, you've done the wrong thing. So guys fall into this like, well, if I just keep a big distance and I run backwards whenever he comes in, and that's why Dustin can flick out two left hands that aren't intended to land, step through and catch you with a booming overhand. But he tried it against uh, Oliveira here, and because Oliveira came out with the intention of backing him up and not retreating towards the center of the cage, uh, Dustin tried to step through, just got clipped with a left hook, couldn't step through and do the right hand. <laughs> it was, it was uh, really interesting to watch. He just sort of went, oh, and then went back to uh, Southpaw again. Dustin did knock him down early with um, a good counter right hook because Poirier, uh, sorry, um, Oliveira was looking for the right uppercut quite a lot and he was reaching with it a little bit too. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a big 
uh, exposure punch, the, the right uppercut. The rear hand uppercut especially is, is like asking to be counted uh, if you don't move your head afterwards. And uh, especially if you like reach out with it. But I think this is the thing, like the whole Charles Oliveira recent run spits in the face of like this guy's fragile. And it, it will continue to be a thing. People will keep going like, but he does get hit and knocked down in every fight. You know? <laughs> but the thing is that he hasn't been like close to getting knocked out or it hasn't seemed that close to getting knocked out. He, the moment he hits the ground, he's like loading an up kick, pulling his knee up to his chest and throwing it at their head. Um, and he's working almost immediately. And we got a little bit of the uh, the Charles Oliveira guard, which is gorgeous. And it links so well with the Ryan Hall, the stuff that Ryan Hall was doing. But, um, you know, he went for a... Uh, he, he threw an up kick as um, Poirier was coming in, got the triangle, switched to the omoplata. They were talking about how he's grabbing the glove. He was moving his hand around, so I don't think he was actually holding in the cuff. But I have seen people holding the cuff. Um, Dan Ige did a, a full, like, old school open guard cross sleeve grip tripod sweep with his fingers, like, fully in the glove. And the, the ref just looking at him and not doing anything. But um, that omoplata was really important, so I can see why people got, are going to get hung up on it. Uh, if they aren't hung up on it and they listen to this podcast, they'll get more hung up on it and uh, be like, oh, he cheated and, and won because of that. But if you noticed, we talked last time about how Charles, Oliver, sorry, Dustin Poirier uh, always, like when he's taken down, he scoots his butt to the back to the cage. Wherever he is, he tries to get to his hands and scoot back to the cage. And that's why he played. It, it, firstly, he can get up quite well from a lot of um, from under a lot of fighters. But secondly, he played right into Habib's game because Habib wants people to try and war walk. And Dustin is all about that ATT war walk. But because he rolled through on the omoplata and ended up on the bottom in the middle of the cage, uh, when they asked him afterwards, he was like, I was too far away from the fence. I didn't want to try and scoot all the way back there. And I really didn't want to give up my back. So he ended up on the bottom trying to lock her figure four um, leg positioning in, sorry, a body triangle um, in closed guard, which is just stalling. And good for the ref. He let Charles Oliveira work from that position. Back when Anderson Silva was doing that, they'd just go, right, that's it, back to the feet, everyone. <laughs> but Oliveira didn't need much much space. You know, one um, frame off the face, like hand under the chin or elbow into the, the uh, windpipe and then drop the other elbow on his head. And he was able to do some really, if, well, certainly uh, it looked good, the hitting he was doing. It didn't seem to uh, cut dust in much. But that was really the turning point of the fight because there was a lot of like, oh, looks like Dustin might have hurt him there in the first round and sort of halfway through the second round. And then after that, just getting stuck on the bottom, it didn't look like... Uh, it looked like Oliveira was taking control quite handily. He'd been landing good knees to the body, uh, good front kicks to the body out in the open. Uh, he'd be, you know, And also, it, get, it, it does uh, take energy out of you if you're loading up big swings and you're getting clipped with shorter punches en route to those big swings. There was a, uh, another moment of Oliveira doing well, like... Or, or, or um, more than anything, like staying composed when he's getting hit, because he doesn't react great to being hit a lot of the time. But he threw a one-two, got dinged back with a counter right hook, and immediately came back with a three-two. So it was one-two, bang, three-two. Like he just went through it like it didn't happen. Well, not like it didn't happen, but like he just knew that the important thing was to keep working and to keep alert. Um, whereas, you know, you watch him back in his, his uh, early days when he got hit, he was just like, uh oh, I'm on defense now and I don't like that. But yes, man, what a wonderful fighter that Charles Oliveira is. Obviously sad for Dustin, um, cause he is, you know, he was sort of like the heir apparent to the lightweight title. The assumption was like with no Habib, Dustin should be the champion. And, um, no, you know, got beaten fair and square and very convincingly. Naturally, Nate Diaz just starts talking shit on Twitter immediately afterwards. So at least Dustin has two uh, massive payday fights or you know, at least good payday fights lined up. He can do the fourth with McGregor and happily retire. He can do a uh, fight with Nate Diaz, probably easily win and um, retire off that if he wants. It's just going to be quite hard to get another title shot in, uh, in that division with how it is. For, for Oliveira, I suppose, um, are they doing Gaethje versus Makachev? Oh, no, they're doing Makachev versus um, Benil Dariush. So perhaps the winner of that or Justin Gaethje, I suppose. I think Gaethje probably makes the most sense right now. Um, yeah. And he'll probably, like I said, be the underdog in that fight as well. So what else was good on this card? I'll tell you what wasn't. Jeff Neal versus Santiago Ponzinibbio. Ooh. 
should have stuck with Masvidal versus um, Edwards, lads, if, if Masvidal hadn't pulled out, sadly. Um, this was crap. Like, Jeff Neal has, I said on Twitter, face blindness. Oh, no, he has below the face blindness. He doesn't see anything except people's heads. Um, just the most one-note headhunter I've seen in forever. Uh, and Ponte Nibia looks sluggish as hell. So, yeah, it was just... And then there was an awful lot of, like, splayed fingers. Uh, the ref kept saying... Watch the fingers, and then that was it for the fight. And both of them have poked people quite badly before. San Diego, Bottas, Nibio, especially. But, um, yeah, crap fight. Less said about it, the better. Let's talk about things I enjoyed. Oh, Emmett versus Ego. I told you that would be fun, and it, it was good fun. I don't know if it lived up to my expectations, but it was good. I put out, um, I should have made it my lock of the week, but I said uh, on Twitter this week, uh, Dominic Cruz at 3-2 to two for a decision, uh, win that is, Good odds. And then Emmett versus Ige, they had really good odds on um, going it, it going to the decision. And I was like, Dan Ige has bad game plans, but he is tough as nails. So I can definitely see that fight going to the decision. And it did. So I, I won that bet, which was nice. Um, I think I had my Dominic Cruz by decision parlayed with the um, O'Malley win, obviously, because that was a, a gimme. And then the Amanda Nunes win. So Amanda, uh, Juliana Pena fucked up my uh, my parlay there. But Emmett versus Ige was good fun. I mean, the, Emmett dropped him almost immediately. The, the speed he covered the, the floor, he did a little skip up with his back foot and, and um, into an overhand, like a jab overhand. Knocked Ige down. Ige managed to wrestle up and almost get uh, Emmett's back, and Emmett did a nice, like, old-school wrestler escape of, of letting the guy fall off your back over the top of you. Um, but the crazy thing was, like, these two were banging from the first round. One guy had been dropped, the other guy had almost got on the first guy's back, and... Daniel Cormier is telling a story about how he was telling a story about how fast he pitches a baseball the other day. And you're just like, what are you doing? Um, Dominic Cruz called him out for it this week. And it, just the, the simps defending DC being like, I like him. And then he won personality of the year at the MMA Awards this year. And I was like, oh, that won't help. Um but oh, some people fucking love this. Some people are like, yeah, what I want is just people. I, I want my friends talking while I'm watching fights. I want Daniel Cormier doing like a beer bong while we're, while we're watching fights. Then they cut to the, the side and John Anik and Joe Rogan have got a yard of ale each. Um, but yeah, it was just really fucking stupid. And he, he, you'll notice he, he was fucking mum during the um, Cruz Munoz fight. He was on point, focusing on the action at all times. No bollocks from the outside. Uh, until like right near the end but this one he's just like it, well i mean cruz versus munoz was before this so he must have just had like a a pent-up amount of bollocks he needed to say that he was then like guys you won't believe who wouldn't believe when i told them how fast i can throw a baseball the other day oh you just said that josh, josh emmett throws punches fast that brings me on to an interesting point about some bollocks but i was amazed by the trouble that josh emmett was having with um Ige's jab off both stances, actually. But he just pumped it out. Like, there was there was a moment in round two where he pumped out three back-to-back. -back. No feints, just three jabs. Every single one snapped um, Emmett's head back. But round two was strong for Ige, and then um, Emmett came back in round three. The, Emmett was doing really well with a right hand to the body, level changing and throwing either a right straight or a right hook to the body and coming up with a left hook afterwards. But yeah, it just felt really nice and high stakes all the way through because they were both throwing, like, two-punch, three-punch combinations, trying to take each other's heads off. Um, yeah. Emmett got the decision. I, I suppose you could have made the argument for Ige. It was basically what was expected, though. You know, I, I always say Dan Ige fights two bad game plans and has the skills to hang with people, but like will continue to lose these decisions just by not doing smart things. And that was basically what happened here. Though, you know, it's, it's hard to take down someone like Emmett. He does have very good takedown defense. So um, I suppose he was sort of limited to boxing with him. Then Dominic Cruz versus Pedro Munoz. This one was another one that was pretty predictable. Um, I said that uh, Pedro, Munoz, Pedro Munoz is going to not use any ring craft, not, not, corner, uh, not corner Cruz at all, and then uh, throw lots of low kicks and miss, and everyone will be like, see, low kicks don't work on Dominic Cruz anymore. <laughs> Luckily, um, Fight Metric has a crap way of counting low kicks because they gave Pedro Munoz like 37 of 40 landed on uh, Jose Aldo, where he basically didn't land anything well. Um, and then they gave him, like, I think it was 11 of 16 landed here against Cruz. But he was missing, like, all the time. Um, just because, like, he made the, he let the fight play out in the centre of the cage. He very rarely 
got Cruz to the cage. And when he did, it was it was so seldom that he did it that he got excited and then just threw a haymaker or missed completely. You know, you you'd need to watch someone like Henry Cejudo to watch this done well. He really does position Cruz well. He knows that he's going to take a step back anytime he comes in. So he fakes him back towards the cage. And then he engages him. But Pedro Munoz was out in the middle of the cage. Anytime Dominic Cruz threw punches back at him, he backed up. Which it makes it very hard to cut the ring if you're willing to give that much ground every time the other guy shows you something. And Cruz isn't a, a banger. He's not a hitter. So um, God knows what Munoz was doing here. But um, he did drop him in the first round or, or hurt him in the first round with a jab as Cruz was coming in. It was when Cruz was trying to bump down the outside of his stance from Southpaw and throw, throw that big overhand left. Uh, just got dinged on the way in. Uh, because, you know, he's not, he never uses his lead hand-to-hand -hand fight from that southpaw position. But otherwise, it was the it was the hits from Dominic Cruz, you know, the stuff we talked about in um, Absolute Masterclass, Garbrandt versus Cruz. And then Garbrandt had an awful fight on this card, so yeah, good, good on Dom. And doubly good on him for pointing out that Daniel Cormier never does any fucking research. Like, I say it every week, but people like Laura Sanko, uh, Paul Felder, Brian Stan, obviously, I have a shrine to, but guys who like feel like they need to justify why they've been picked for that job. They actually do their work and they keep up to date on who the fighters are or they watch a load of fights before the event. Daniel Cormier just rocks up and he, he doesn't even hide it because he keeps calling everyone this guy and then their name. This guy, Smith, he's blah, blah, blah. So good on Cruz. And then every, I, I was hoping everyone would notice this this time because Cruz has pointed it out. But they, you know, Cruz is a bit prickly in his own right. So people were um, pissy at him instead. Taiju Ivasa versus Augusto Sakai was exactly what you expected. Um, you know, good for Taiju Ivasa. You know, I've been very down on him because he looked so bad in those, like, three losses back-to-back. -back. They gave him, like, a really decrepit Junior Dos Santos in, in that way that they do, where they're just like, go on, knock him out. And then Taiju Ivasa couldn't and actually got knocked out on you know himself. Um, but he's actually, his last three or four, is he on a four-fight win streak now? Yeah, four fights in a row. Yeah, he's looked good. I mean, it was Stefan Struve, Harry Hunsucker, and Greg Hardy, who aren't great, but Augusto Sakai is legitimately top 10, you know, as bad as that is in the UF, well, in heavyweight MMA. Um, yeah, good counter left hook, classic Mark Hunt stuff, you know, takes me back to when I first saw him, and I was like, ooh, Mark Hunt 2.0, maybe? Um, yeah, you know, he's working with ATT now, or no, sorry, AKA. Uh, DC was going on about how they've been working together, so yeah, I can only see that helping him and improving him. And then he did the shoey at the end, but nobody spat in it, um, which... It's probably disappointing for him because it, it's very much like a humiliation fetish thing he's got going on. Just, you know, you cannot get in, he cannot get enough feet and spit in his pint. But he has branded himself fantastically. Like everyone was going mental when he got up on the cage and they threw the shoe to him. It's just a bit weird to be involved in it as a spectator. Bruno Silva versus Jordan Wright. This was sad because Jordan Wright did a great job early on, just gave a great account of himself, uh, kicking wonderfully, dinged Silva up took him to the fence, started kneeing him from the double collar tie. And then it was literally what happened to Lewis Smolka the other day. In fact, he just landed a good knee. And then in that moment between the knee landing and his, uh, you know, and him taking control again, there was a little bit of space. Bruno Silva could move around, threw an overhand, chin right. Uh, it's it's a real danger. Like, you know, we, we think of the double collar tie as a, uh, a great position, like a position of domination. But it isn't always. You know, people like Fedor used to enter like proper clinches and throw people off it. Um, Nick Diaz used to enter body punching from it because he could just shrug the shoulders and knock the collar tie off and hit the body afterwards. Fabio Maldonado, you know, in his successful UFC fights, he basically just put his head on the opponent, let them take the double collar tie and punch the body while sort of looking down at them. And I think the only way to deal with it, like there isn't a, a, a safe way to do, to do it, but like when you, you can't push your... It's the thing, because, like, you know, we always say push your advantages, but you can't push your advantages too much because then, they, then you let this happen or you, you are in danger of this happening. Uh, you've got to know when to push people away. You've got to really push them away so that they can't swing. They're off balance. Or you've got to get your shoulders up and get down behind them, turn your head with the punches. But, it, like, the punch just caught him over the back of the head because he was, you know, standing straight upright for it. Um, but, yeah, I thought he looked good up to that point. Bruno Silva had big power and uh, did the Andy Hug answer to the uh, double collar tie. Yeah, we don't train the uh, the clinch in karate. We just we just bang. <laughs> uh, Andre Munoz versus uh, Eric Anders. This was uh, well, Eric Anders' striking looked decent. Then Munoz got um, the takedown. Anders got up, looked like he was getting up really well. Sort of Rob Whitaker stuff. Build up, uh, try and get the elbow back in and turn back in towards the guy. 
Uh, Muniz was trying to get on his back. Basically, the change was when he went from the seatbelt, which is one arm over the shoulder and one arm under the shoulder, to both arms under, which is like a body lock. And then he he got around behind Anders. He was able to pull him off the fence and then put his leg through like he was getting a, a hook to get on the back. But instead of jumping on the back, you, you straighten your hook out and hook behind their other leg. And that's uh, I think Ben Askren called it a broomstick, but that's just how you sit someone down in your lap. A uh, great way to get on people's backs. And... Um, Munoz has this great arm, but I think it was the same one that he caught um, Jackeray with. But he, he, Anders was tripoding up another sort of like wrestlery escape to try and get the guy. You take out one hook and let the guy fall over the top of you. But he started tripoding up. Munoz grabbed for the leg, like he was going for um, the Zul- the Suluev stretch. You know that Zabit and um, Aljamain Sterling hit in the same night. But the way that he'd gone for it, he had gone over. Um, or inside of Anders' arm on that side. So he basically had like a, an overhook and he'd, he'd wrapped up the arm. So he went, he went over for the arm bar instead, like on an overhook arm bar, which was very cool. Ioki used to do ones like that and uh, Matt Serra had a DVD where he showed it, but like from the back, instead of attacking the arm on the side that you've got the, uh, uh, the underarm for a seatbelt, you like hug your own knee on the other side and use an overhook arm bar. Very cool. Quite exciting because, you know, submitting it at Jacare, I was like, well, Jacare's ancient now. That's probably just a you know a bit of a fluke and catching him at the right time. But this guy's jiu-jitsu is legitimately very impressive. MMA jiu-jitsu, obviously, which is different to jiu-jitsu jiu-jitsu. Uh, Aaron Blanchard, sorry, Blanchfield versus um, Miranda Maverick. I actually missed this one. I saw people raving about Blanchfield. I'll go back and watch it for the boy cast, probably. Ryan Hall versus Derek Minner was a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, sorry, Derek Minner. Um, I said on the boycast, like, Minna, from what I've seen of him, he's like a good wrestler who loves the front headlock and, and is well-versed in submissions. Whereas Ryan Hall is obviously a jiu-jitsu savant who isn't that great a wrestler, um, but has picked up, like, a point fighty karate book, uh, game on the feet, and Derek Minna is decent on the feet as a banger. Um, this came out really fun. Uh, Ryan Hall, firstly, great job reading when Derek Minna was um, switching to Southpaw because Minna fights orthodox, but then he would switch to Southpaw for like little flurries. And every time he did, you watched Ryan Hall, who was fighting Southpaw, uh, like bend down, wrap over Derek Minna's lead leg like he was going for a guillotine. So he basically like overhooked it. Uh, and then he'd do a forward roll and he'd either um, start inverting an enter on the leg or uh, Minna would sprawl and he'd get him, he'd catch him in a, a sort of triangle. Very cool little move. Uh, he was trying to do those against Tapuria and they weren't working that well. But in this one, he just he read it perfectly and he, he got it uh, several times as Minna was stepping in. And there, were, there was another time where Minna just sort of squared up as he was attacking along the fence and Ryan Hall hit that on his leg. So I suppose it's not, it's not that he has to be southpaw, it's that that leg has to be close enough for Ryan to roll on. But it's interesting because it's the complete opposite to... I mean, it looks like an Iminari roll, but it's the complete opposite to an Iminari roll. Because in Iminari roll, you sort of like take your head outside their, their leg or whatever, and you reach inside like underarm and spin around it. If you watch like the, the very old videos, of, I, I think there's a very old clip of Ryan Hall teaching it on YouTube. But um, this one, he's going... He's wrapping his arm over the leg and like forward rolling through. It's very interesting. Um, I... You know, I have no idea how to do it. And there's all, a lot of positions in this fight where I was looking at them going, I would try that and then neck myself trying it. Because you know, I know like good inverters say like, well, you're not supposed to have any pressure on your neck, but I'm not a good inverter. And I would immediately put a load of pressure on my neck. Um, yeah, I mean, he did it from the turtle uh, in, a, in a similar way to uh, his um, open elbow DVD is fantastic. Uh, he talks about a movie he calls the hip... Hippoplatamus, I think it is, but it's just like from the turtle when the opponent's reaching over your back, you get their arm and you roll through and open up their elbow with your hips. And he was sort of doing that uh, and ended up on the legs at one point, which was very cool. And Derek Minner was game, which was uh, good because like Ryan Hall went for leg attacks and Derek Minner didn't like freak out. He was there defending leg attacks. He's clearly someone who's experienced with leg attacks, um, you know, put his foot in the crook of Ryan Hall's knee. Uh, I think he got it from the 50-50. Ryan Hall was attacking the knee, the, um, inside heel hook and he managed to like peel Ryan's other leg off him with his uh, with his heel but the interesting thing was like when guys stay on their feet and then like turn their back and freak out and run from the heel hook which totally works like if you you know can work rather uh, a lot of guys will stay standing to deal with heel hooks and things like that and they turn away and they run away or you know if you uh, try and heel hook someone from the saddle uh, a very common defense is for them to turn away and 
basically run from their butt up to their knees and feet, which means you sort of lose them. But with the 50-50 and particularly the way that Mino is defending it, you you lift your legs up and you start kicking at their legs to free your legs, but you, then your butt's on the floor. So what happened was that Ryan was able to come up on top of Derek Minner um, into half guard, which is quite interesting because we don't see a lot of Ryan Hall from on top, and he, that was true in uh, a lot of um, no gi competition as well and gi competition. So he was very uh, patient trying to pass the half guard. Ended up in mount at the end, uh, walking the arm up, trying to get the arm triangle. Um, but yeah, it just looked like it sucked for Minna. He couldn't really do anything to get out of it. I saw a great comment on the BJJ subreddit, which was basically like, if you didn't know, you'd think that Minna wasn't trying to get out of it. Like that's how flat his hips were smushed in that mount. Um, but I think what was really impressive for me was the guard work Ryan Hall was doing. And I'd seen him do it a bit against, um, I think it might have been Artem Lobov of all people. But it's uh, sort of related to what uh, Charles Oliveira is doing. And it's sort of related to what uh, Rafael Lovato did against um, Gegard Mousasi, regional champ, uh, which is the the hand goes inside the thigh and is the anchor to pull the head around and throw the hips out. And that Charles Oliveira uses that to throw up arm bars and then the guy will retract the arm. You know, it's, it's an arm bar where he's like, I won't actually get that. And the guy will retract the arm and he'll recenter his hips into a triangle attempt. And you see him do that all the time. Like my favorite examples are from the Hioki fight. I think he did it to Dustin even. Um, but the uh, the that underhook, you know, that that's like the Fedor thing where you grab the thigh and you spin yourself into the armbar. Um, but the that sort of like inside thigh attack um, grip links in with all the stuff that guys are doing now from um, what's called the matrix in the gi. But it's basically just like inverting on the leg. It's how you used to go for like an uh, for a knee bar, but nobody really goes for knee bars. But you do use the position to end up on the leg and then um, attacking the heel hook. So what Ryan does is he, he goes under the leg with his right hand and then he goes across the face with his left hand and pushes and gets his left knee inside and spins over around the leg or Minna sprawls backwards and Ryan goes back on the triangle. And he was trying to finish his sort of reverse triangle and they were having like a debate on commentary whether he could finish it. But there is a great clip of him in an absolute um, competition against someone who's got like 100 pounds on him and he finishes it like that. You, you just sort of have to get on your side. Uh, and then the shins like in their armpit and, uh, and he teaches it on his terrific triangle dvd which was like the the one that made him uh sort of instructional famous because he was famous as a grappler for like finishing about 200 people by a triangle uh in in competitions like every weekend but um that first series on the 50 50 in the triangle that was when people were like oh these these are actually way better than like anything else that's out there Instructionals used to be like, it, oh, you know, Fabio uh, Gurgel or, or Mario Sperry turning up and be like, here's some positions I like. Whereas Ryan's thing was very much like, I am doing one topic to death in this uh, instructional. But yeah, go go watch that clip of him finishing his, like, I, I don't know if you'd call it a reverse triangle or invert. I suppose it's a reverse triangle. But if you search reverse triangle on YouTube, I'm sure you'll find it. Ryan Hall reverse triangle. So honestly, great fight and... Um, you know, Minna gave a good account of himself jujitsu wise You got to see what Ryan does well. And um, he took some good punches on the feet and didn't seem to care about it, which is also, also good. But more importantly, like that's, uh, he fought in, when was it? July. Uh, and now he's just fought again in December, which is great because his previous ones are like 2019, 2018, 2016. You know, it was really it, it, almost impossible for him to get two fights in the same calendar year. Uh, and now he's got this done. And he said he had a really bad like time getting ready for the last one. but. Um, you know, sometimes I, I was hoping that was going to happen with Leo Santos, where if you get the loss, you just go, fuck it. I want to get back in there and get a win as quick as possible. Which is sometimes not a great thing. Like, you know, if you, if someone gets knocked out badly, like Marlon Marias, and then he's like, I will fight three months later and suddenly doesn't have a chin anymore. Um, but sometimes it's a good thing for like people who just aren't really fighting a lot. Plus, it's got to suck if you're someone like Leo Santos or Ryan Hall and you're doing all the training and you're not getting the fights because training you're still getting lumps taken out of you you know you can fight you can spar as safely as is possible to be for a for a professional fighter but you're still getting tweaked in um grappling you're still getting dinged in uh boxing and kickboxing uh, the, the training adds up it's not just the fights that tear people down so you're doing it for effectively nothing until you get the fight booked and then um tony kelly versus uh randy costa this was sad because randy costa like they were saying randy costa runs like 40 miles a week or whatever it is I don't know if he's just having adrenaline dumps or what, but like after the first round, 
he's very, very not well. He's, he just doesn't really have a gas tank. And um, Tony Kelly really came out and just got in his face from round one. And Costa's answer was to like clinch him. Uh, you know, uh, Tony Kelly was getting like uh, collatized and double collatized and threatening knees and things. And Costa would go like go in hip to hip, grab the body lock, and then he'd end, he'd end up staying there. You know, he, he, he's supposed to be the guy who wants to get out and strike at distance, but because Tony Kelly kept grabbing collar ties, he kept closing in further and then ending up in long wrestling um, clinches. The ending was very strange because it was like the, the ref didn't want to stop it for what Tony Kelly was doing, but Randy Costa was doing nothing. Like he was just sort of laying there going, I have no energy. So I've no idea what the solution is there. Like, do you, do you do more cardio? Do you do more um, sprinting? I don't know. Do you need a sports psychologist? You know, if, if he gets a sports psychologist and wins the next fight, then he'll be like, a sports psychologist cured my gassing problem and swear by it for the rest of his career. And then Gillian Robertson versus um, Priscilla Cachoeira. Gillian Robertson is absolutely my girl. Uh, just She's my waifu now, my MMA waifu. Because firstly, hilariously polite Canadian. Uh, but also, like I'd seen a fight before, and, and like the, the way she goes after takedowns, it looks like she has no idea how to wrestle. And then she'll hit a really good one. And you go, oh, damn, nice. <laughs> She's going for these desperate low singles. And then suddenly she'll just throw like a stumpy low kick and time a perfect level change. Uh, head in the center of the chest. Get both knees. Just run through Priscilla Cachoeira. Uh, and then she got on her back. And it was it was good because like the way she was going to get the back, she had the over under. But Priscilla Cachoeira was like coming up to standing. And this happened in, I think it was again, Lobov versus um, Ryan Hall. But the problem is like with the over under, or the seatbelt from the back. If the opponent gets up, they can bring their near arm between your hips and theirs and like move away from you. And then you're left with like a crappy sort of head and arm headlock and they're coming up behind you or whatever. But in that low bob fight and in this one, um, the, the person with the over under tried to do like a rolling back take almost immediately as the other guy was put coming up. And uh, Reverson didn't get the, the hooks in, but she did get the hand under the throat immediately and then began choking Cachoeira without the hooks in and Cachoeira reaches up behind her feels with her thumb and then drives it into Gillian Robertson's eye and the ref goes Chris Toyani's like don't do that and then she did it again and then luckily I mean Robertson got the choke but honestly I would have no problem disqualifying people from there like the the Lee, Lee G, fucking I was about to do a Brendan Shaw and called him Jingling Lee Jing Liang uh, or Jing Liang Lee whichever one's correct um, when he was against Jake Matthews and he got caught in a very deep guillotine and he just reached up over his own head and drove his fingers into um, Matthews' eyes to push his head back. And you're like, that is that should be a tap. You have a, you're, you're panicking so much, or you know maybe you're not panicking, maybe you're doing it deliberately and you're willing, um, but you're admitting that you can't get out of it without cheating, so that is, you're done. That's a submission in my, in my view. Um, but yeah, she gets on the mic afterwards. They ask her specifically about it and show the replay. She's just talking about it like it didn't happen. She's just like, oh, no, no, it's all right. I was just hoping the ref would uh, would stop it or whatever. Um, so yeah, top girl, Gillian Robertson. And Priscilla Cajuera, get fucked, love. I was coming around to her this week. I was going, do you know what? I've I've always said she's the worst fighter in the UFC, but she's stuck around so long. She's won a couple of fights. She's trying god love god loves a trier um and then someone just immediately linked me like the domestic abuse accusations against her and i was like oh for fuck's sake but and then she very deliberately thumbs a girl in the eye twice so um no fuck her priscilla cachoeira and she missed weight by like five pounds i mean what what the fuck else can can you do to turn people against you but anyway that was the event i thought it was it was pretty good given the lack of star power through a lot of it um let's do a question and then we'll get out of here for this week Greetings, Jack. Almost every UFC fighter, including Amanda Nunes and Cody Garbrandt currently, trash talks their opponent and puts down their ability. She's a clown. She can't fight. She doesn't belong in the same cage with me. Or he's a quitter. He's easy work. Who has he beaten? I don't understand the logic. Isn't, the, isn't this exactly the opposite of what a fighter should be saying? If you trash talk your opponent, aren't you really putting yourself in a no-win uh, position, so to speak? If you win, you've beaten a terrible fighter who shouldn't even have been in the cage with you. If you lose, you were beaten by a terrible fighter who shouldn't have even been in the cage with you. But let's say you build up your opponent. She's dangerous everywhere. This will be a big test for me. Or this guy's put people in the hospital. So yes, this is a very dangerous fight for me. 
Then if you win, you've beaten Godzilla. But if you lose, well, it took Godzilla to beat you. You look better either way. Jack, what's your take on this, including why do so many fighters uh, trash talk and not build up their opponents? Much thanks, Joe, from the SF Bay Area. Coca grounds. Coca stomping grounds. Um, I think, um, yeah, it is easy to sort of overthink this because the value of trash talking is not in actually convincing people that your opponents are bums. There are... I, I struggle to believe that everyone who swarms to the Filthy Casuals Guide after a fighter loses to tell me that they're a bum actually thinks that the person who just challenged for a title is a bum. Um, some people will. I think there are a good number of absolute idiots out there, but that's true of you know um, every field. Um, but the, the whole point of trash talk is to use like inflammatory language to convince people that you hate each other. And you don't normally. <laughs> it's just a big farce. Um, if you talk your opponent up, yeah, maybe the people who watch presses will be like, oh, well, maybe her opponent or his opponent is, is very dangerous. But the people who watch presses are a very limited crew. And the only reason that anyone watches presses is because they want to see people smack talk each other. With your Fedors and your GSPs, there was always that like air of... Um, class and uh, respect for opponents and so on. But that took them being the best in the world for quite a long time for anyone to care. Uh, even with GSP, you know, people got much more excited for like his rematch with Matt Hughes, Matt Serra, uh, Josh Koscheck. The Josh Koscheck one's like the only one GSP's ever said anything nasty about anyone for. And that's probably the most famous clip of GSP in the, you know, in the MMA sphere. The one of him being like, when I'm done with Josh Koscheck, he won't be in title consideration again. He won't be a top welterweight again. He will just be some guy. Uh, and that this is the effective end of his career. And I think that he had even more effect, to be honest, because he didn't typically do that. So people got very excited about it. But um, the old adage about like winning, uh, bring, catching more flies with honey than vinegar is not true in combat sports. Uh, what Mayweather said about like open mouths, sorry, closed mouths don't get fed. That's the truth. You've got to make noise. You've got to be a dickhead uh, and get people invested in your fights because people are more invested in watching some dickhead lose than they are in watching a, a good, respectful fighter win for the most part. But what you will notice about fighters typically, if the beef is not real, if the beef is manufactured as most beef is, or the beef is just like a um, uh, an outcome of training wholeheartedly to, to murder someone for three months or two months or however long it is, um, you'll notice that, and, and Hemingway said this about like great generals, you can't bring one great general up to another without upsetting them. But if the, other, if the great general brings up another general to you, and it's normally one they've defeated, they will speak about them in glowing terms and then you can join in. Most fighters are very happy to talk up people they've already beaten. So yeah, I think there's a place for it. If Kamaru Usman didn't have beef with his next opponent and just said he's a terrific fighter, well, actually, he has done that with, like, Gilbert Burns. Um, but, you know, Kamaru Usman's still going to make far more money and get far more views by having actual fake beef with um, Colby Covington. And if they do the third match, even after Colby, like, saying in front of the world, yeah, no, I was just selling the fight to Kamaru Usman, and Kamaru being like, yeah, cool, we, le we both made a lot of money out of it, uh, people would still buy it, for, or they, you know suspend their disbelief for the third fight when they started beefing again. Right, I reckon that'll wrap us up for today. I'm going to be back midweek to talk about some fun stuff on the boycast. Not an awful lot of big fights going on this uh, next weekend, but I did watch a dog shit film called Halle Berry's Bruised. I think it's actually just called Bruised, but I call it Halle Berry's Bruised, um, where she directs, she stars, she sings the theme tune, she writes the theme tune. And it is, it's genuinely not good. Um, so I'll be talking about that at great length next week, I imagine. Uh, if you want to support the podcast, read the articles, get the boycast, sign up to the Patreon. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing anytime, fightprimer.com. Don't forget to check out the um, Filthy Casuals Guide to Dustin Poirier before I private that one again. And then I might put up the uh, Olivero one again. Um, just because he's hot right now. I am your boy, Jack Slack. Priscilla Cachuero is the bum-ass bum bless. <laughs>